very more person full of consideration for the difference. But this, I repeat, I insist, without having to express any regret or doubt about the legitimacy of what has uh, been perpetrating in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He presents himself to the audience, of course, as a democratic subject that is the opposite of a fascist group. And as the saying goes, there is nothing money can offer. As this, for me, very quite horrible scene also shows, and so far as contemporary state crimes are concerned, once more, what we see is that the main issue in such a case, the main issue is not moral, it's political. What really matters is not the way individuals, mostly, mostly political leaders, statesmen, or any other public figures, the way they talk about remorse, repentance, the way they apologize, the way they go, and they have to take a stand on these crimes. What actually, what really matters is the way some person who is in charge of public affairs and has the, in his or her hands the authority to speak in the name, speak for, in the name of the state and the nation or any other group or community is a representative of the way he or she takes responsibility for the crime that has been committed in the past in the name of this state, community, etc. And the way he or she will attend a clear statement about what these actions have been, that these crimes, and what those who perpetrated them are criminals. Now, today, uh, as an example, let's say, the Conservative Party, which has been ruling Japan almost without interruption since the end of the American occupation, these people, they are the specialists for this kind of ritual and formal apologies which are addressed formally to the people who have had to suffer from the atrocities perpetrated during the Second World War by the Imperial Army, but which at the same time get quite well together with nationalist apologies, vows, etc., declaration with statements which go perfectly well together with nationalist, revisionist statements on the past and, of course, as we saw quite recently, the uh, ever uh, lasting solemn visits to the Republic Shrine. So, okay, that's what I wanted to say as a comment on this uh, extract from uh, White, White Light, Black Bread, an excellent documentary, I must say. Uh, if you have time to see it, just do it. And so now we can, except if you have something to say, now uh, we can pass to I here in here. So this is the, the, <coughs> at the beginning. Um, the old man who lives in fear uh, is here in some kind of a it's a court, but for let's say family affairs, so it's a special court with some civilian community. Only one judge. His relatives, his sons, and all his relatives have lodged a complaint against him because he wants to sell his factory uh, and he wants them all uh, to 
lived in Japan and settled down, down in Brazil. And of course, they do not agree. So, okay, they have a lot less complaint and so they, and they are arguing uh, vehemently, as you will see uh, in this book. So I continue. Um, <laughs> I continue on Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and from below. This film was already from from below. So the atomic destruction of the, the two cities from this time, not from the viewpoint of an um, hallucinated old man, but from the viewpoint of the survivors. The survivors as narrators of the disaster. Um, a lot of things could be taken uh, into account. Of course, Japanese films, for most of them. And I have focused on only on some of them. So, Children of Hiroshima, you see a short part of it. Children of Nagasaki, but it was not available, so I will not be able to show today anything from it. Black Rain, we see so part of Black Rain, and next time, Rhapsody in August. And also, if we have time today, uh, an animated film, Barefoot Game. Um, what I would like to pay special attention to is the question of the, of the description of the apocalyptic uh, climax of the disaster. Uh, climax that is the dropping of the bomb and its immediate consequences below, on the ground, in the city, and for the people who live there. And to be more precise, uh, I should say that I focus on the question of the representation of the destruction of the city and of its uh, inhabitants and this under the effect of the bomb. Uh, so of this uh, special, new special terrorist device, the bomb, the atomic bomb. And I would like to show how narrowly intertwined are on such an issue aesthetic stakes and political states, as I already tried to mention last time about this uh, issue of the uh, couple. I would like to insist on a rather complicated question. Uh, I'm asking myself if something like uh, cultural Dissent, uh, difference, dispute uh, exists or manifests itself as, let's say, in simplified terms, of course, a Western narrator and an Eastern narrator have to deal with such an object we are uh, dealing with. Yeah, that is historical catastrophe, extermination, crime against humanity, extreme violence, uh, etc. This question is inspired to me insistently by a careful, repeated examination of the films we are going to talk about today. Each time I see these films, I feel I had a feeling that there is something I cannot accept in the way most of them, not all of them, we will see the Kurosawa film, that is absolutely in August, uh, has to be set upon here. Something which I cannot accept in the way most of them describe, that is, represent, depict horror at its height, that is, 
the minutes, hours, days of agony which follow, uh, immediately follow the nuclear destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I think that this discomfort or this uneasiness caused by these pictures is something which has to be worked out uh, for I'm convinced that it leads us to the question of the hypothetical descent between East and West on the question of a representation of disasters, just as I mentioned it before. I have absolutely no definitive statement uh, on this issue, but on this issue, just question, suggestion. But I'm sure it's a very important question, a very important issue. So, to begin with, in Western Europe, in the post-Auschwitz era, and in particular from the 80s, the last centuries on, a rather wide, I would say, rather wide consensus, intellectual, political consensus, has become established on this issue. The racial extermination perpetrated by the Nazis during the war, Second World War, being an incomparable object in historical terms. That is an event which bear the mark of the absolute, which is unique and not only exceptional. Under these conditions, this object necessarily challenges all the traditional narrative forms. Uh, it is also a unique diegetic matter. It means in terms of narration, description. This question is very difficult if we take it from the angle of artistic devices. How can painting, how can literature, how can music, photography, and of course, last but not least, cinema, movie, deal with this object in particular? According to the above mentioned Western consensus in for in, in the elaborated worked out in the post-Auschwitz era, genocide and particularly the Holocaust. Holocaust is not a very appropriate term for me, but anyway it's the way to say things not in English or in America. So it's a Holocaust cannot or should not be represented that is put into words, put into sentences, into sounds, pictures, etc., as if it would be just an ordinary event or just an ordinary historical, violent historical object. I mean, a battle, a civil war, a revolution, etc. For as such, as an object which is unique, the genocide and specifically the Holocaust questions and challenges thoroughly the way not only the traditional but as well the modern narrator relates and depicts this kind of event. Why? What is typical for a modern genocide is that the perpetrators do their best in order to erase, to rip out the traces of the crime itself. The destruction, the relation of the traces of the crime, this is part of the crime itself. The documents, the sites, are destroyed. The witnesses are killed. The 
they've been created by perpetrators and their accomplices, the bystanders, they have to keep their mouth shut. This is what we usually call the gas chambers ferret in the Nazi, Nazi extermination camps. In that case, uh, in that figure, the perpetrators have destroyed all of the devices which were meant for industrial murder, and this before they had to retreat to the west and the Soviet army was moving forward in Poland, 1944. Then, of course, then it will be this an easy game for those who are interested in denying the existence of the genocide project, in denying the existence of a genocidal intention by the Nazi. It is an easy game under this condition just to ask gas chambers. But okay, if you talk about gas chambers, we need, we want, we demand tangible material proofs. We want evidence. Where are they? We want, we demand documents, traces, or pictures, witnesses, etc. And in the absence of all this, we only can have, we only have, we only can have very strong doubts on this issue. Has such a device really existed? And this situation, we have to notice, is not only typical for the Holocaust. This kind of situation in which people well, generally of bad faith ask these questions, this situation repeats itself on every occasion as alleged perpetrators of a genocide have to be put on trial or as historians, statesmen, experts are conflicting over the definition, the legal definition, the historical, the theoretical definition of what happened. Was it just a bitter civil war? Uh, was it a mutual extermination? Was it a bloodbath? Was it a very severe repression? Or was it, properly speaking, a genocide? So, you know, classic example of the Turkish state and the Armenians. The Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, the genocide in Rwanda, this narrow relation which exists between genocide as a project, as a program, and of course, including the following actions. This relation um, makes impossible the shaping of a narration in terms of representation or according to the patterns of what, let's say, a realistic faithful, accurate depiction of it would be. In that case, the narration displaces itself from a realistic reconstruction of the event or of genocide, as a series of action, deeds, scenes, as it's usually the case when a battle or a civil war or described or reconstructed in a novel or in a film. It, the narration displaces itself to another given horizon, which is that of testimony. testimony. Since a classic description, I mean classic, just simply in realistic terms, since a classic description of the event has the absolute and utmost prime since such a classic description is impossible for lack of substantial traces, the narration of the genocide has to displace itself, that is to move in direction of the survivor. Survivor as the key witness of what happened. He who attests that what happened really happened, the crime. 
the only witness who has the capacity, the ability, and the authority to testify, to attest that what happened was not just the result of an unfortunate combination of circumstances, but the result of a premeditated plan at all, of carefully and systematically planned actions. The survivor, as witness, is the only one who has the authority to answer for the reality of what happened. The genocide as a fact or a set of facts and not as an allegation, a fable, just a story, etc. And this is the reason why the uh, exemplary film from the Holocaust, the Shoah, by the French filmmaker Lodansman, uh, which is a nine hours long documentary film and not a drama uh, or of or a fiction film. Uh, this is why this film is ex has been exclusively made by Lansman of testimonies that the survivors from the camps and from the extermination plans set up by the Nazis, but made also, of course, uh, of testimonies of, of perpetrators, bystanders, witnesses of all kinds. So in this film, in this documentary film, no reconstruction, no, let's say, guided tour on the sites or on the basis of horror. Or it is clear from this uh, inmate, that's man, that there is absolutely nothing to see, absolutely nothing to see on such locations, nothing to grasp there about the dimensions of the crime, since all or almost all of the traces of the crime have been erased. Only the witnesses can help us to get the measure of what the extermination project of the Nazis has been. From this angle, which is, as you know, this both together aesthetic and political, from this angle, Shaw is just the opposite uh, of a film like Spielberg's Schindler's List which is uh, mentioned just by passing Chitlas is the film which once man holds up in public public. From a, uh, let's say, Lanzmannian, Lanzmannian angle point of view, the famous shower scene, you certainly remember this scene, we will show it to you later. But this famous shower scene in the, at the end of Spielberg's film, that is, you see a convoy with the Jewish women prisoners arriving uh, in the camp, coming to the camp in a train. And these women are immediately brought to a building designed as showers. And their hair are being cut. The prisoners, they have to undress. Um, and they proceed to the showers of all the public audience is wondering what's going to happen now, what will be, what will pour out the shower, the shower heads, hot water or poison gas, from B. So there is the classical suspense at that point. And finally, to our brief relief, it's water, it's not poisonous gas. So, from a uh, Lansmanian point of view, this scene is really a shame. It is the exact equivalent of what the capo 
tracking shot was Florida. That is a moral and political uh, collapse. Okay, but there is something else, yes, uh, which is not only about the narrative form, but which is about pictures. I think it is a widely shared feeling, sensitivity, let's say, in Western Europe, that attention, or maybe some kind of a dissent, divorce, let's say, exists between genocide as a specific form of historical crime and extreme violence in modern societies. There is a divorce between all this and pictures, and pictures. The representation of genocide through pictures, any kind of pictures, photos or films shot by the perpetrators or witnesses, reconstruction, staging of genocide scenes, all this is extremely contentious for us in Western Europe. Genocide is at first, we have to feel, genocide is at first what should not be exhibited, what should not have spectators of any kind. In other terms, genocide should be an absolute exception to this common current let's say, regime of pictures, regime image, according to which violence, ultra-violence, disasters, catastrophes, horrors of all kinds, all this is the flesh and the food of the aestheticization of our life. This is what Walter Benjamin says. Or the flesh and food of what uh, the contemporary of Benjamin um, Siegfried Kakawa calls the ornamentation of the mass and this through pictures. An example of that. Some years ago, a violent, very violent polemic uh, raged in France after a well-known philosopher, aesthetics, George Didi, Huberman. After Billy Huberman published rare, very rare, saved, let's say, saved pictures um, shot in a Nazi extermination camp by prisoners. Pictures showing rather indistinctly, but still showing uh, naked people entering a gas chamber. Pictures, pictures shot in extreme conditions, of course, with a camera the prisoners had stolen from the Nazi, and which they took, of course, at the risk of their lives. And after having shot them, of course, they could not develop them, so they buried the films in the camps in empty bottles. And these films have been found years later. Um, and at the time, as most of those were shot and cut it. So for Didi Huberman, these pictures, they had to be published. And this for obvious reasons. Because they bring evidence for the carrying out of the so-called final solution. They, in that sense, they support the fight against revisionist groups, which persist in saying that the gas chamber had never existed. But on the opposite, for the supporters of Lanzma, who build up a very consistent group, at least in France, these pictures, they are just obscene. Publishing them, it is 
getting caught up in the spectacularization that is becoming a show of the genocide. The most radical of these opponents, who did Huberman, even suggested that these pictures, instead of having been published and or exhibited, they should simply have been destroyed after having been discovered. And this for, for the following reason. For these people, publishing these pictures was by thinking that they would be useful in the public debate on the Holocaust, this is to play into the revisionists' hands by endorsing the notion of a debate on this issue. Because they think there is no debate, there should be no debate, because the genocide is a fact, so there should not be any debate on this. And those who just intend to discuss, to have a discussion, to open a discussion on this, they are uh, simply the perpetrators yes, That's what they think, that's what they say. So what I would like to insist on is this. This kind of debate, which can seem maybe enigmatic to you, this kind of debate has very deep roots in Western and let's say especially first of all in European culture. The genocide perpetrated by the Nazi has become in the post Auschwitz era era not only a central element in the collective memory of the Second World War, but something like let's say a shared trauma. This burning memory has revived, it has reawakened the ancient traditional mistrust, suspicion towards fiction, which is a tradition which is in our culture as old as Plato himself. That is the idea that the picture is deceptive, that uh, it is misleading, misleading in itself because a copy of the real object is always some kind of a fake. The notion of deception as associated with the copy returns with renewed force as we think about the representation of genocide. What it appears to us uh, as what par excellence has to resist to the genocide, I mean, what has to resist to its transformation into a picture, what has to resist to its, let's say, becoming picture, a becoming which is, or which would be due to be a distortion, is due to be a degradation, or, plainly speaking, a reason of what the original object which cannot be imitated is, that is genocide. So as a rule, we are wary of pictures which pretend to represent, which pretend to depict, to take into account, testify about facts and matters related to extreme violence. We are inclined to feel, to think that these pictures misrepresent and distort these facts and matters. This is like, I would say, a prolonged effect of the above mentioned platonic tradition. And of course, as you know, uh, as some kind of a compensation, we feel very easy, we feel very relaxed as this kind of catastrophic, apocalyptic, ultra-violent picture is disconnected from any direct or any real reference. As you pretty well know, we love catastrophic films. We love George Romero's Living Dead. We love the Living Dead series on television. 
we love to attend the end of the world, the end of the times, at any moment, but uh, on the condition that it is just fun and entertainment. It's a simulation on a screen. It's a long time already that disaster, hard violence, monsters, epidemics, disastrous floods, sudden climate changes, devastating nuclear attack have become for us a show. But provided they come from our imagination and they have as narratives the status of some kind of a game. And now, the second reason why we are so reluctant to associate pictures with genocide has something in common with religion, or should I say with archaic immemorial religious feelings. Genocide awakens great intensifies in a rather obscure way the feeling of the sacred, the sacred as a feeling. Since it is a crime which challenges our political understanding, our rational faculties, but as well our imagination, some kind of dubious ambivalent the sacralization of a genocide as the absolute and utmost disaster is the way we try to escape this discomfort. So we talk about the unforgivable, we talk about the unforgettable, etc. And then, as we talk this way about the genocide, the uh, immemorial, let's say, immemorial images in Western culture with boomerang. So we remember that according to some deeply rooted tradition, traditions, the representation of the sacred is a mortal sin. The genocide as the absolute evil is what should not be put in pictures exactly the same way God's face should not be disclosed or portrayed according to distinct uh, religious traditions. And this is exactly where we track down Lanzmann's film, Shoah, the Holocaust at the absolute evil one can only testify about and what may never be shown, what may never be exhibited or represented. So, through this long uh, detour of diversion, I am just trying to make explicit the reasons why some of the images of the apocalypse some of these images of the apocalypse we bump into in Japanese films on Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, stick in, let's say, stick in a Western spectator's throat, or at least are very problematic for him. For very obviously what this Western spectator faces there is uh, let's say, regime of pictures, I don't know how to say it in English, say it in English regime image, which collides not only with what he, the Western spectator, is accustomed to, but collides also with what is acceptable for him, in aesthetic, moral, and, I repeat, political terms. And what I think what we come across here is a classical descent between cultural patterns. And this, of course, is the, what's interesting. As I, as, let's say, the, the Western spectator, uh, but other Western spectators may disagree, of course, this, but as I see 
Uh, these pictures, uh, we will have a show, we will see them in a moment. I mean, pictures of horribly burnt bodies, human flesh, skin becoming liquid, faces uh, without eyes. When I hear these agonizing cries and shrieks uttered by the dying, when I have to follow this very diligent crack in on pipe bodies in the smoking rings, all this in a very literal and basic expressed, in a very literal and basic realistic style, or even, I would say, worst of all, when I have to listen to the pathetic music which is served with all this, I mean a very facile imitation of Western church music. So every time I bump into these sequences, my reaction is immediate and territory. This kind of old blood and thunder narrative is not the right way to testify to the disaster and the crime we are facing here. It is not the right way to pay our tribute to the victims. It's a complete wrong direction in narrative terms. In, I insist, altogether aesthetic, moral, and political. What makes, for me, what makes the platinum dead end, let's say, a mistake of this narrative choice, the authors of these films, it is for me this a detail, it's a detail that it's actually it's not a detail. The kind of maker, the kind of maker they have to resort in order to represent what a like chop or chop or royal body is from the effects of the bomb. The maker they need for this to fabricate this kind of thing of object, of cinematographic object, it is exactly of the same kind as what you currently find in zombie or living dead films or series. And this means that the usual game with horror and terror, which is basically the tradition, the great tradition of Halloween, this becomes indistinct from what is the purpose of these film makers, that is the big the horror of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that is to pay their tribute to the victims of this incomparable crime. And for me, of course, this narrative failure is all the more regrettable since these characters are great artists. They are not businessmen, they are great artists. And their commitment to the, uh, let's say, anti nuclear force is indiscriminate. But of course, but of course, what is the authority of such a Western critic of these films, specifically of the description of the apocalyptic climax of Hiroshima Nagasaki they these uh, filmmakers propose? Maybe, perhaps, I'm wrong on this issue, an issue we already had to deal with uh, about banking. Uh, 1937, because um, surreptitiously, I tend to take the genocide that had such a powerful symbolic value for us, that has such a powerful symbolic value for us, European, as a general pattern for any kind of modern disaster or absolute crime. And this way, of course, I tend to transfer, transpose the narrative models we in Europe have worked out in the post Auschwitz era to transpose these patterns on or into other situations, into other historical and cultural contexts. Maybe what we have to take into consideration here is the existence of different regions of pictures, and this in relation with extreme violence, historical disaster, and heterogeneity, which, and this making it quite possible for a Japanese director to depict 
what is for me the indescribable to depict it in a way that is according to rules, to codes, to patterns, which are maybe, I don't know, quite satisfactory, convincing for his public, that is the Japanese or an Asian public. And this is the question I would like to ask. Just to finish on this issue, um, a last, um, yes, uh, a, a last remark on this issue. It's on ruins, ruins and ashes. After, let's say, a traditional uh, bloodbath or massacre, or after a war, after uh, in a traditional regime of violence, let's say, uh, after a barbarian conqueror has been there, let's say the Mongols, what is left, of course, are ruins. In a dynamic perspective, ruins is what you have to rebuild, of course, what you have to restore. Take the example today, Gaza, after the 50 days of bombing by the Israeli Air Force, okay, very quickly, all kinds of farmers are very busy with the construction of what has been systematically destroyed in all past August. So, in narrative terms, ruins are also a very crucial element. They are what a narration, a long narration, and sometimes even a funding narration can be built on. For us in Western Europe, the classical example is Virgil's long lyric poem, Ene, the Ene, that is, um, narrative, a long narrative, a long poem, which tells how survivors from the destruction of the city of Troy travel through the, the Mediterranean as until they rejoin Italy and then they will be the founders of the city of Rome. And the movement in this from the ruins, from the destruction of Troy to the foundation of Rome. In other terms, ruins are the perfect material, <coughs> the perfect support for a dialect, dialectic, dialectical, dialectical narrative. That is a narrative which makes you pass from a disaster this, to various steps, phases, various scenes on which the negative, in Hegelian terms, the negative is staged to a new superior positive uh, stage. A new positivity emerges in the case uh, I'm presenting here this new positivity, of course, it is the city of Rome, as the heir and glorious descendant of the destroyed Troy. So this is the general model, model we can keep an eye on as we think of, in general, the ruins as, let's say, a historical narrative device or state. But what we have to take into consideration is that, is that with events like the Holocaust or Hiroshima and Nagasaki, this model doesn't work anymore. That is, we pass from the ruins as a paradigm to another model of paradigm that is ashes. ashes. And ashes, as I would say, a concept, not 
of course, theory of elements, but as a concept, it's completely different. Because ashes are not in conceptual terms, of course. A material you can buy build anything on. You cannot build in a narration, a city, a new history, a national narrative, anything on ashes. Uh, no uh, dialect operation or movement uh, can happen with ashes. Ashes, in that sense, is not like ruins, a devastated landscape. You can develop a narrative from or build on. And this is the reason why the survivors from the extermination camps or from Auschwitz, uh, from, uh, yes, uh, Auschwitz or Hiroshima, they don't tell the story. They do not tell the story as narrators, the story of the ordeal they went through, because they cannot be, they cannot be, properly speaking, narrators. They just can testify about it. And this has witnesses, but witnesses of what cannot be or cannot become a narrative or the object of a narration. They are the witnesses of an impossible narration. And the symbol of this impossibility are the ashes. And that is what ashes has, have no topography. They are the design empty place, ground zero, that is a non-place. Okay, so this is what I wanted to say as an introduction to the, the clips we will see now from these Japanese uh, films. <laughs> Okay. 首先犹太集中以后这样子死因为无论是导演或是摄影在一个新浪潮或是新的电影美学的过程很注意就带着平凡的精神去看类似这一种拍这样子的片子的时候在处理像这种无论是南京大屠杀犹太的集中营法师法师的那个法师室或者是广岛长期原爆政治的时候广岛或者是四件的大屠杀的时候
坐火车要过来的那一批女的，可是过来他们才发现那些女生为什么都没有到，原来错了，他们又被运到奥兹维斯集中营去，而不是到他们这个工厂来的。那现在我们要看的影片，就是说，像他刚刚讲，这些人。在 Steven s p i e l e r 在他在导这部戏的时候，这些女孩子一进去的时候，他们就马上被剪头发，啊，然后呃，原本他们以为他们是要搏命的，他们是被救活，但是他们去的时候被被送错地方了，他们就被剪头发了。那是不是观众在这一开始就跟着紧张起来？因为他们被送错地方了，他们是要去，他们去被人家杀死了，然后又被剪头发，然后呢，他们又全部被推进了那个呃，说要叫他们去洗澡。那其实“笑”这个字，但在你的定义就是你到瓦斯瓦斯经济社区，他们就是“笑”用这个字。那他们全部被推进去了，灯又关了，啊，灯又亮了，啊，大家都很惊慌，我在等候。所以他们在那里面，他们观众是很不细的，观众也跟他们一起都很惊慌的，因为存活到底是死，到底是是生，就在这一刻。那郭大老师，他刚才在强调说。这是这种拍这种电影的时候，你要起码道德在，你纯粹是为了用一种呃，无论你是一种在吸引观众，或是在呃，再加上你的所有的电影技巧什么，这里就已经没有道德存在，甚至这里就变成是你在操弄观众的情绪，在愚弄观众，甚至你转移了这些问题的真正的问题的重心跟焦点，这是很不道德。然后再像好比说我们呃上次看那个《金陵十三钗》的时候也是一样，呃那些日本兵到了教堂里面去了，啊那个美国人说他是神父，然后他又把里面那个红十字会的那个旗子很大的旗子放下来的时候，说那个日本兵一过去拿了一个刀子，啪杀他，观众都害怕，看那些情况比较凶。我老是认为说这个就是一个非常不道德的地方。你用这种方式来制造、制造那个情节的高低起伏，但实际上，你知道这个的下一幕就是一个集体强暴，不可以用这种方式来去处理南京大屠杀或是南京事件这么呃严肃的，或是所谓的刚刚龙传所谓的绝对的一个历史事件。那现在我们要看的就是。呃，新的名单里面这一个刚刚提到这个，当然就是同学你们，老师希望大家讨论啊，就是说，呃，甚至，呃，有这种历史，有这种严肃历史意义的，呃，事件的时候，当电影要呈现的时候，是不是不可以用这种方式来呈现？或者像刚刚我们刚刚他说的，当然是，我那我们当然也会再继续讨论，就说，到底像呃，纳粹集中营这个。你可以，你可以为把照片呈现出来说，有的确有这些事，的确有瓦斯，好、哦，有瓦斯是这个瓦斯毒气杀人的这件事，因为有一部分人说他既然已经没有任何的呃证据显示，因为法国有所谓的，在欧洲后来有所谓的什么，因为这段历史，那、啊、当然他就有，就是有这段历史，我我那个我们那时候有人拍的这些呃。图片这些照片，我们显示的的确有这件事情，可是对欧斯曼他来讲，他说这种事不用去跟他讨论，这个事情它就是存在的，他即使没有留下任何的痕迹，我们也不可以把它像表演一样把它呈现出来，这是不需要讨论的。这个是这些事件，它其实没有任何的讨论的空间，它就是存在，它就是一个事实，所以他花了九个小时去拍纪录片，就是用那些。存活的，曾经参与过的，甚至是呃那些波兰人在住在附近的波兰人去讲，这样就够了。你这样子，我们要了解到呃奥斯维茨说话的这个过去这一段历史，用这种方式，用刻意在拍像新德勒名单那种片去呈现，用那种商业电影的手法去呈现的这个二十世纪在人类历史上最重要的事情。我们先看这个。Okay. So my my advice would be never accept this kind of crash. You are free to do as you like. Okay. Now we can maybe we can discuss some 
Yes. Uh, okay. Um, so should we go on? And, uh, okay. So children of Hiroshima. So as you see, you have a city. City in peace, peaceful city. People just go into their business. Children playing. It's a sunny hot summer morning. Looking of war. That is air raid warning. Warning raised. And this we have not seen was before. Just before some long tracking shots to a very quiet city. Um, and all this is shown in a flashback. Um, that is a young school teacher who remembers the moment before, the instant before the raid. And then we see this uh, school teacher young woman uh, in the ruins, the ruins of her parents' house who have been killed during the raid. And then we go back to the instant before we see the plane in the sky. This is what we have seen. We see the plane in the sky, the clock. Then we hear, yes, I don't know why we didn't hear this, the, the ticking of the clock, which goes crescendo. And then the white flash, which overcomes everything. So the first thing which is startling for me, and I, just, I had the impression that the narrative and the aesthetic handling of this of this apocalyptic moment is very Western. It's very Christian because we here have this. Uh, horrible pictures shown here, the sound music which is doubtless a requiem, it is religious music in homage to the dead in Christian tradition. We see bleeding bodies like caught in a storm and martyrs. For us obviously uh, these bodies are bodies of martyrs. We hear agonizing cries that is the end of the world, apocalyptic moment. And the school teacher stands facing this disaster in close up and she is obviously the witness of the mothers in this mother city, Hiroshima. And the strange thing here is that uh, in the history of the, the bombing of the two cities, the martyr city, it is Nagasaki, it is not Hiroshima. Because in Nagasaki, many of the inhabitants of Nagasaki were are still Christians. Or it was one of the first places where Christian missionaries began to evangelize in Japan. Uh, and if we have time to see the children of Nagasaki, the other thing, children of Nagasaki, you will note how important this issue, the Christian issue, is important in the Nagasaki problematic. So questions like how could Christians, these Americans, reduce to ashes the Christian city? Or as well, people asking, people from Nagasaki asking was the destruction of our city God's punishment for our sins, things like that. Uh, so we have to ask ourselves uh, about what appears in this film, Children of Hiroshima, as some kind of a contamination of the famous filmmaker's narrative by surreptitious Western standards and sensibilities. The question of the music is at this place very disturbing. Is there, in such a sequence, no alternative to this kind of imitation of Western pompous religious music? For if Hiroshima Nagasaki is a completely new, unprecedented event, which interrupts the course of modern history and is in your world for a new era, how can the work of art, which intent, I mean the film, 
which intends to testify about this, about this uniqueness of the event, Hiroshima Nagasaki. How can this film be placed under the sign of this rather conventional mutation of forms and contents which are borrowed from Western countries? Or, in other terms, is the mimetic pathos of this sequence likely to support our efforts to grasp is what in this event goes beyond our imagination and our understanding. Or does music, this kind of music, just contribute to petrify us with fear and horror, as the pictures, of course, also do? Okay, this is the question I'm asking myself on this sequence. This is not from Children of Hiroshima, this is from a film which is called Hiroshima. Hiroshima, uh, it was shot in the beginning of the uh, 50s. Uh, I forgot the name of the film. Barefoot Gen. And then we start. <laughs> 